But open your Bibles if you haven't seen the app yet to Daniel chapter number six. You hopefully have seen it all, all week long on Facebook. We're talking about Daniel and the lion's den today. Man, what a tremendous account. What a tremendous story, Daniel and the lion's den. But we're not going to get to the lion's den today. All right, there is no way. I'm working on this sermon. I'm like, good grief. It may take us three months to get to the, to the lion's den because there is so much truth inside of Daniel chapter six. Daniel meets the lions, and today I want to introduce us to the players. You know, any great story, any great, you, you watch a movie, they introduce who's going to be in this movie, who's starring in this, in this particular show. And we have the players today in this particular account with Daniel and the lion's den. I believe there's some great truths as we look at the players, but I want to challenge us this morning in an overarching theme, all right, to stay the course. If we could sum up this particular account, we could call it a matter of faith, but we'll call it faith and, and to stay the course. Daniel stayed the course in his life, and in this account he stayed the course. Stay the course in serving God. Stay the course in pleasing God. Stay the course in the midst of your trials. Stay the course when life is good. Stay the course when life is hard. Stay the course when the checkbook is full. Stay the course when you can't find the checkbook. Stay the course when you're getting along at home and stay the course when you have to take a long walk by yourself just so you can survive at home. But stay the course. Stay the course when you're healthy. Healthy. Stay the course when you're sick. Stay the course when you get good news from the doctor and stay the course when the news isn't so good. But would you stay the course? This morning, I challenge us to stay the course from Daniel and the lion's den. Lord, help us this morning as we look at your word. Lord, help us to see some truths it would touch us and change us. Lord, sometimes life seems and sometimes life is difficult. But you are bigger than any problem. Lord, you're greater than any need we have. You're a tremendous, wonderful God and a wonderful Savior. Lord, enlighten our hearts and eyes this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. It seems that one day a kindergarten teacher was, having, was helping one of her students put on his cowboy boots. Now, we could use this particular story on public or teachers' appreciation day here at First Baptist Church, but we kind of had to skip that Sunday. And in fact, if we did teacher appreciation day today, it'd honor a whole lot of moms and dads, not just the ones who are paid, all right? And I've seen a lot of those memes, those little, those little quotes on Facebook, and, and they're all funny. I, I think one of the, the best ones that I enjoyed was one that I saw uh, written on the back of a SUV, and it said, you lied, my child is not a joy to have in class, all right? <laughs> As principal for 12 years, you caught us. <laughs> Sometimes your child's not a joy to have, but we still love them. And you should too. All right, don't kill them. We didn't. But it seems that one day a kindergarten teacher was helping one of her students put on his cowboy boots. He asked for help and she could see why. Even with her pulling and pushing and twisting, the little boots still didn't want to go on his young five-year-old's feet. Finally, they got one boot on, and, and with, with some work and consternation, the second boot was on, and she worked up quite a sweat. But she almost cried when the little boy said, Teacher, teacher, they're on the wrong feet. She looked down, and sure enough, they, <laughs> they were. Have you been there before like that? But stay the course. It wasn't easier pulling the boots off than it was putting them on, but she managed to keep her cool uh, as together they worked to get the boots back on, this time on the right feet. It was only then, after they were back on, after the even more consternation and sweat, that he announced, well, these aren't my boots. <laughs> oh, I'm sure we've been there before, parents, teachers, anybody who lives in this world where you have to bite your tongue right then. And she did, and rather than scream, she responded this way, well, why didn't you say so? And once again, she struggled to help them off the ill-fitting boots off his little feet. And no sooner had they got the boots off his feet than the boy replied, Well, they're my brother's boots, and my mother told me to wear them today. <laughs> Stifling a scream again, as the story goes, she mustered up the grace and courage to wrestle the ill-fitting boots back on his feet yet again. And helping him into his coat... She said, now where are your mittens? And he replied, I stuffed them into the toes of my boots. <laughs> Life ever seem like that to you and to me? It does to me sometimes. 
Seems like everywhere you turn, something else happens and you want to scream or vent in frustration, irritation, and despair, discouragement. I think that humorous story gives us a tremendous insight on life as a Christian to stay the course. We cannot decide whether to live or die. We can only decide what we will live or die for. We are called as Christians to live for God. We are called as a child of God to serve the living God. And this morning, I want to introduce to you the players of this chapter. If you look in Daniel chapter 6, the first few verses, the first three verses, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdoms in hundred and twenty princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first. That the princes might give accounts unto them, and that the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm a decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. This morning, this first nine verses of the chapter introduced to us all of the characters of this story. And the first one I look at, of course, is the character by the name of Daniel. No secret to whom Daniel is. No surprise that Daniel would be back front and center in the book named after him, Daniel. No, no secret that Daniel once again would be facing a trial. We notice already in the book, as we see in almost every chapter besides chapter 3, where we have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, that Daniel is already following God. In chapter 1 and verse 8, he's purposed his heart. In chapter 2 and verse 18, he's prayed for wisdom from the God of of the secrets. In chapter 4, verse 27, he's pleaded for repentance for God. And in chapter 5, verses 26 to 28, he's pronounced God's judgment to Belshazzar, the writing on the wall. You see, already in this book, Daniel has showed that his heart is turned toward his God. And I want to uh, introduce you to Daniel again, a man who has continually, who has consistently turned his heart toward God. He consistently showed a life that followed the Lord. Nothing bad that I have found is written about Daniel. Though he was not perfect. We know he's not perfect because the only one who is sinless and was sinless on earth is Jesus Christ. So though not sinless, nothing is recorded that is ill about Daniel. No bad decision that he made, though I'm sure he made plenty of them. What was important in this book, important for us to learn, is that Daniel was a man who followed God consistently. I'm glad to know that you and I can follow God consistently. Perfection's not the goal. Daniel's not said to be perfect, but he's shown that he, when faced with hardship, will follow God. He, when faced with having to bear truth, follows God. He, when faced with two choices, purposes to follow God. He consistently showed a light that followed God. Daniel is one of the lead characters of the story. If it was a movie, Daniel would be the star who's playing this part. He's a flawless life that we have. He has an impeccable character. A consistent application of God's word in his life and God's wisdom. Man, what a man's man. 
And the fact is, we have no idea what he looks like, except that he was good looking. That's how we know that from chapter 1. The comely children, the ones who looked good, that were well desired, well favored, they're the ones that were brought back. So he was a good looking man. Pastor would often say something like this, if it was him preaching, he, oh, he looked like, oh, none of you. Right? And my wife would all, often fill in at that point, though you probably never heard of the pastor, she'd say, she'd say, my husband. Or she'd say, JD. All right? And my wife's not a liar now. All right? But Daniel, he was a good-looking man, but that is not what made him important to the story. He was a man who was good-looking on the inside. He wasn't marred on the outside, but he wasn't marred on the inside. He consistently followed the Lord. And he consistently showed a priority for God over man. Throughout each of the chapters, we see him consistently showing a priority for God over man. This is key to this particular account. Because man is going to have him face some difficult trials, but he once again will show a priority for God over man. I'm going to ask a question. You know what I'm going to ask? Do you show a priority for God over man? Well, that's natural, isn't it? You know I'm going to ask that question. Of course, of course I'm going to ask if you show a priority for God over man. I mentioned this past week in one of the little recordings my wife and I do, that it's really easy right now. And I've not preached a lot on the COVID-19. I did a couple early messages and then I stepped away and got back to series. Many of you mentioned and thanked me for getting back basically on with regular life. All right, but let me just pause here real quick. There is a lot of sensationalism out there. I am not saying it's all fault. I am not an expert. But you understand that the media wants to sensationalize everything so you watch it and you pay attention to it. On, on your phone, they call it clickbait. All right, big, bold headlines, shocking things, so you click on it. All right, they want to capture your attention. I realized early on in this pandemic that if I filled my mind just with news... It would bias me, all right? It would tilt me all right, in, a play that I, in a way that I don't want to be tilted. It would affect my thinking. It would, with fear or, or with just depression. Wow. If you happen to read everything that's out there, you do not get a good outlook on life. Right? You, you don't get the fact that God is alive and, and the sun is shining, all right? What is every news article? You know, perfectly healthy individual, gone, Right? I mean, that's why you can't Google when you're sick. You know that, right? I hurt my toe. Google it. Boy, this healthy man, you know, 25 years old, former Marine, hurt his toe. Boom, gone. Three minutes later. That's what those articles you find. So you have to limit yourself so that you show a party for God over man. This is one thing that I do. You don't have to do this. Some people don't sleep with their phone in their room. I do. Right? It's my, my, my nightstand. Doesn't mean I'll hear it, but it's right there. But when I wake up, all right, and then I grab my phone, I don't flip over to news. I flip to my Bible first. And I read a quick psalm. It doesn't take me very long at all. But I want the first thing in my mind, if I can, with God's help, to be God's Word. I believe what Pastor Dylan is saying, that God's Word changes lives. All right, I want it to change my life. I want it to change your life. And you know what? I'm afraid that some of you, not afraid, I know some of you, grab that phone, quick, flip right to Facebook, right to your text messages, right to news, and instantly your mind has now a priority for that instead of God. You see, Daniel showed a priority for God over man. I want to have that priority in my life. And I want it not just to be what is spoken, but what is actually done. See, sometimes we trade for God for the things of this earth. We trade for God other time. Instead of spending time with God, we spend time with the television or media. Instead of, instead of time in prayer, time in worry. Instead of time in worship. There's an old legend of a swan and a crane told by D.L. Moody. A beautiful swan, as he told the story, alighted on the banks of a water in which a crane was wading about seeking snails. For a few moments, this crane viewed the swan and the wonder and then inquired, well, where did you come from? As the story goes, the swan replied, well, I come from heaven. Heaven, said the crane. I haven't heard of heaven. What is that? And the 
Swan began to go on to describe the grandeur of the eternal place. The swan told of the beauty there and the wonder there and the gates and the walls and the river of life, the trees and everything. Finally, the crane interrupted. I said, well, are there any snails there? Snails, replied the swan, of course not. Then, said the crane, you can have your heaven. I want snails. Isn't that true for what we do sometimes? We know the eternal splendor that awaits us. We know the wonderful glory of time with God and this time even now here on earth as He works in and through us. And sometimes we trade it for a slimy snail. Daniel consistently showed a priority for God over man. That was his past, but Daniel was also promoted. Daniel had been promoted a few times. and In fact, in this passage, it shows that Daniel, in verse 1 and 2, um, in verse 2, Daniel was the first of the three presidents over the 120 princes over the whole place. So there was Darius, and then he set these 120, and, and then above those 120, there were three. And Daniel was the first of all of them. He was promoted. What you hopefully will remember that in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had made Daniel a great man. He was promoted in chapter number 2. In chapter number 5, under Belshazzar, Daniel was also promoted. This was not the first time that Daniel had been promoted. All right? He looks like every time you, you read another story, Daniel gets another accolade, another title on the end of his name. As I read that, I thought of this verse, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Yeah. Or can I say it this way? God's blessings follow our obedience. Yeah. As we follow God, God's blessings follow. During the early years of the Salvation Army, William Booth, General William Booth, who the founder of the Salvation Army, and his associates were bitterly attacked by the press and government and different people. Sometimes his son Bramwell, as he said, would show his father a newspaper attack. And his father would reply, Bramwell, 50 years from now, it will matter very little how indeed these people treated us. It will matter a great deal how we dealt with the work of God. Right. And you know what? I've never heard of the Salvation Army being under attack, but I have heard of the Salvation Army and what they've done. 50 years from now, very little will we know of how we are attacked, but it will be a big deal how we respond to God. And God's blessings follow our obedience. I want to obey God. Not just for promotion. I want to obey Him because He's my Savior. But not only was this pastor is promoted, but Daniel was preferred. Daniel was the favorite. This is really where we start to have a slight twist to the story. This is really what sets up the confrontation later on is because Daniel was the teacher's pet. He was put up first. The Bible tells us why he had an excellent spirit. Some of you are the teacher's pets. You know who you are. Some of you are the favorites in your family. You see my parents at home watching today and I'm sure I'm going to get a text about this later on. But that's okay. Sometimes you just have to go forward, right? Stay the course. I'm one of seven kids. Parents love all the kids the same. But all the siblings, if you jump on siblings later on, we all know who the favorite is. We all, I won't mention them on live stream or outright, but we all know who the favorite is. But I remember this little thing growing up, all right, to sell out my father. And I love my father dearly, just a moment. But I remember this. We'd grow up and my sister was older. I'm the, the first boy, the second child. And this is verified, this is fact, this is a stronger fact than Wikipedia, all right? I mean, th this is truth right here. My sister would go to my dad and say, Dad, could I have a dollar? Maybe for lunch at school, something like that. I remember my dad, and it seemed like, it wasn't this much, it seemed like he'd take a 20 out of his wallet. It wasn't this that much. Here you go, honey, sweetie, keep the change. If I went to my dad, and I started working when I was in fourth grade, painting, so I Worked a lot. And if I went to my dad and said, Dad, I need a dollar, it seemed like, it seemed like that my dad would grab four quarters and say, bring me back the change. Now, I'm sure my memory is wrong. But you've been in that class before, haven't you? Teacher's pet. They get away with everything. 
It's not normally accurate, all right? But it seems that way. But the Bible tells us that Daniel was preferred above all of them. He had an excellent spirit inside of him. All right, but, but he was, he was preferred. He was the favorite. He was up in front, which is why we have a problem later on. An excellent spirit. This word excellent there is only found, only found in the book of Daniel, this word for excellent. It speaks of excellency or greatness or exceeding greatness. In fact, in one other place in the book of Daniel, it is referred to in the furnace on how hot the furnace is, exceeding hot. It's that same word that said of Daniel's spirit. So as hot as that furnace was seven times, killed people when they got close, that's how excellent Daniel's spirit was. In comparison to the hot furnace, it's compared in other place to the greatness of the king's majesty. Nebuchadnezzar, the conqueror of the free, or the, not free world, but the world at that time. His excellency, his majesty, in the same word of Daniel's excellent spirit. And it could be, it could be partly how he carried himself, no doubt. But I believe it's also reflective on how the Spirit of God was upon Daniel. There's no doubt in my mind that Daniel had the power of God's Spirit upon his life. Different in the Old Testament than the New Testament. All right, after Jesus left, he gave us the Holy Spirit. But the Spirit is the same. The same power. And this excellent Spirit that Daniel allowed to work through him was excellent. Charles Spurgeon said this, Without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are as ships without the wind, branches without sap, coals without fire. We are useless. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. See, stay the course. A young missionary by the name of Herbert Jackson, he was given a car to help him in his furlough. The car was a major asset, but apparently had one minor difficulty. It wouldn't start. Without a push or jump start. Well, Jackson apparently devised a little system to help him cope with the car's inability to start. When he was ready to leave his home, he went to a nearby school and asked permission to bring some children out of class. They'd help him push his car. He'd apparently pop the clutch and begin the car. Throughout the day, he would always be careful to park on a hill or to leave his engine running when he stopped for short visits. And for two years, the young missionary used what he believed was an ingenious method to enable him to use his car. Well, finally, he had to get back, and a new missionary arrived, and he offered the car to the new missionary. And Jackson explained to the new missionary how uh, the, the methods to start the car. The young man began by opening the hood and ex- inspecting the car. And why, Dr. Jackson, he interrupted, I believe the only trouble is a loose cable. He gave the cable a twist, pushed the switch, and the engine roared to life. <laughs> See, for two years, Dr. Jackson had needlessly worked in his own devices. And the power to start the car was there the whole time. It only needed to be connected. And David, or Daniel had a tremendous spirit. He was connected. You and I have the spirit of the living God if we're saved inside of us. But we must be connected to it. D.L. Moody was to have a campaign in England. An elderly pastor protested. Why do we need this Mr. Moody? He's uneducated. He's inexperienced. Who does he think he is? He doesn't have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. To which an older, wiser pastor stood up. He said, we need Mr. Moody because he does not have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on him. This morning, I wonder if you can stay the course because you have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit or he has a monopoly on you. Daniel's spirit was excellent. He consistently followed God. He made God a priority. But the only reason... He could get through the lion's den. It was because of God. And that never would have happened down there if this actor, this character, had not got with him. My friend, today, there is no way we have enough strength, enough wisdom, enough knowledge to handle any time, much less a time like this. But we have enough God who will do it all. This morning, 
Do you have a priority of God in your life, in your heart, your spirit? You see, the story's about to take an interesting turn. And it would be a devastating story, except that we have a great God. I hope your only fault is your devotion to God. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, I pray you'd help us. Your spirit would examine our hearts. Lord, you've enabled us by your spirit to live a life that we read about with Daniel. Lord, facing obstacles that are crazy difficult. Lord, I see in his life a consistency of priority for you. Your spirit working. Lord, help us. My friend, whether you're here, whether you're at home, do you have a priority for God? Does he have a hold on you? You can easily get sidetracked. The news, our minds, our worries. There's no way we can face a lion's den without the Almighty God. I wonder if you're watching this morning. I wonder if you know that you have a home in heaven. I wonder if you know that if you die today, you'd go to heaven. You know, the Bible tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves you so much. He loved me so much that he sent his son Jesus, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, the only perfect individual. He was the son of God. He was all God and all man. He lived a perfect life and then he died on the cross. He died on the cross to pay not for his sin, but to pay for your sin and for my sin. For the wages of sin is death. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we are all sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We can't pay for our sin by being part of a good church, getting baptized, or doing enough good things. The only way to pay for sin is by death, separation from God. But the good news is that Jesus paid that for you and for me. And my friend, if you're listening this morning and you've never trusted Christ today, believe that he died on the cross for you to save you from your sins, buried and rose again the third day, you can trust him today. The Bible calls that the good news, the gospel. You know that you can believe on Jesus today? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can call upon him today. You can trust him today. Would you trust him today if you've never trusted him before? You can pray right where you're at and ask him to save you. Sometimes we help someone pray a simple prayer. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. It was buried and rose again the third day. I trust in Him and Jesus alone. Wherever you're at, you can pray and trust Him today and He'll hear you. It's not a magic in the words you say, it's with the heart. And you can tell Him that right from your heart. Would you pray that today? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell Him, He'll hear you. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. He was buried and rose again the third day. I trust Him. In Jesus alone. The Bible says that if you ask Him to save you, He did just that. Would you do me a favor if you asked Him to save you? Would you let me be an encouragement to you? On the screen you're at, they'll, you'll see a phone number, an email address, and a website. Would you leave me a quick message, jot me a quick note? Say, Pastor, I prayed that I meant that. I asked Jesus to save me. I'd love to send you a book to help you as a Christian. It's the best news we know. Would you trust him today and would you believe on him? A fellow Christian, if he's not the priority, make God the priority again. If you've not been consistent, you can start today. 
You can't have the lion's den without that, the obedience. Lord, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, help us to keep a priority for you, to be consistently following you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.